Come, Holy Spirit, be in this place. Set our hearts on fire with your love. What we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. Who we are not, make us. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I think it's always important to give you that wonderful thing that you can shock and annoy your brunch partners with on Sunday. Let's do that first, shall we? Melchizedek. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Beautifully rendered. And you're saying, so who's Melchizedek? He was the priest king of Salem, a small town. And you say, and? That's it. That's what we know. Melchizedek was a priest and the king of Salem. But apparently he must have been very good at it because it's noted both in the Old Testament and again in the letter to the Hebrews. So, work it into the conversation at brunch today about Melchizedek. The scriptures for today take us to a place where we may not expect them to take us, as they do most Sundays, if the truth be told. We hear in Jeremiah that God is essentially shortening the distance. God is saying, you know, no longer is there going to be any sort of mediation in the community of faith. I'm showing up directly, and they will not say to each other, let's look at God. No, you will know me directly. And as an echo of that, what we hear from John's gospel today is this gospel stretch that apparently is about one thing, but I want to I want to hold on to the first couple of sentences of the gospel for today. Because I think it takes us to where God is speaking to the people in Jeremiah. Now at the festival there were some Greeks. And they come to Philip and they say in the King James language, Sir, we would see Jesus. What a remarkable thing. You see, I think the truth is that that is the yearning of the entire hurt, reeling, confused world. Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, seemingly, this gospel is about Jesus revealing to his followers what's going to happen in fairly graphic detail that is unsettling in the extreme. He talks about the death that he is about to die, and he does this high theology in the midst of an almost clinical report of his execution. And God knows that we need to hear that, and John remembered it, And I think the place where we latch on to it is in those first couple of verses. Sir, we would see Jesus. Ignatius Loyola, when he was coalescing the Society of Jesus, those who would become the Jesuits, employed several spiritual techniques in order to train his followers, in order to coalesce them as a community as the society, and one of them includes a meditative technique that has just become known as Ignatian meditation, and the technique is very simple. Loyola wanted you to hear the scripture, close your eyes and hear the scripture, and imagine in your mind's eye a picture of what you're hearing, to make essentially a photograph of whatever you're hearing. And if you are able then to do that, the second step is the most important one. Loyola wanted us to find ourselves in that picture. I don't know about you, but I love looking in old albums, old family pictures and that sort of thing. It's fun to sort of find yourself in the family picture. And that's all Ignatius Loyola wanted to do, was to train his followers, those who have become some of the elite of the church, where their intellect and their teaching abilities were concerned, to teach them how to engage the scriptures more deeply 
so that their lives would be more deeply engaged with the scriptures. I ask you to do the same thing. At the very beginning of this, we see Philip standing there. I don't know, maybe he's eating an apple. Maybe he's just fanning himself because it's hot and he's standing under a tree. Whatever it is, the Greeks show up and they say, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, most of us, being the followers of Jesus, the friends of Jesus, two millennia on, assume that we are a part of that cadre, a part of those people who are already around Jesus as his friends, who recognize him for who he is. And that's not a bad place to put yourself. God knows that if you're a baptized person and you're seeking to live a life of faith, you're entitled to that assumption. I think for the purposes of this scripture... You're better off, and I invite you to try this. See yourself in the picture as the Greeks. See yourself as the one who is coming to a gatekeeper, however mild-mannered and gentle he may be, a gatekeeper nonetheless, and asking to see Jesus. It feels very different, doesn't it? When you see yourself in Philip's place, you're wondering, okay, do I have the good answers? Do I have the cool theology? Can I do this? Is there some way or other that I can really represent the Lord well in a crisp, cogent manner? It has a completely different feel if you're willing to let yourself be a Greek, doesn't it? Sir, we would see Jesus. I really do think that that is the unspoken, often not fully conscious prayer of the entire world looking for Jesus. And sometimes they come to us and the only way we're going to be any good to Jesus is if we've been in the place of the Greeks beforehand. Now everybody in this house has had some sort of encounter with Jesus or other, or you wouldn't be here. We live in a culture where the the mores that govern us and hold us together as a culture become increasingly lax around religious practice, the faith that derives or that drives those religious practices. And so what we're doing here today is more and more, vaguely, a little at a time, more and more countercultural and more and more optional. But it was enough to get us up and out the door today to be here. And I would put to you the possibility that you didn't show up to learn how to be a better Philip or Andrew. And truth be told, The yearnings in our hearts are the deep yearnings of the entire world. I need to see him. I need to see him. Now what that does, how we understand the question, will depend on each of us. There are some people who operate with a pretty healthy ego and they assume that they really are an advisory in an advisory capacity with the Almighty, that God will occasionally ask them for good and wholesome instruction or a little this or a little that. And asking to see Jesus in that ego-driven context will give you one answer, won't it? That you're essentially just checking in with the home office. There are others who are not mean-spirited, and they're not ignorant, they're just unaware. And they say, sir, we would see Jesus, and who they're looking for is Jack LaLanne. Anybody remember Jack LaLanne on television? My God, he was annoying. (laughs) To be that cheerful around physical exercise on television early in the morning Seems like a real waste of energy. I remember seeing him as a child thinking, why didn't you just sit down until this urge passed? (laughs) But there are plenty of people who come looking to Jesus in the same way that some come looking for a personal trainer. 
personal development guru, how are you going to buff me up? How is it that you're going to make me a better player? That's not a bad question, but I think you may be missing some serious, serious theological issues if that's where you stay. There are others who are curious. There are others who deal with either the immediate hurt and pain and confusion of their lives on the day that they ask the question or deal with it as a sort of chronic condition in their lives and they're looking for help. I think a lot of us are there. I think a lot of us get up in the morning and wonder. Sometimes you're worried about your kids. Sometimes you're worried about your partner. Sometimes you're worried about the war in Gaza. Sometimes you're worried about the national economy. I, there are all sorts of things that you can get up and be worried about. And the question that comes up out of you is help. I don't think that's a bad place to be. It is a vulnerable place, and we as the good, solid Episcopalians, and God knows we're nice, as the good, solid Episcopalian gatekeepers, like Philip, because we know Philip must have been an Episcopalian, <laughs> are those who need to have a quick and snappy answer. Be a Greek. I think these scriptures set us up for the inevitable, for the rock rolling downhill that will commence on Palm Sunday and following its own inertia will simply keep going, whether we're ready for it or not, right up into an empty tomb on Easter Day. I think that these scriptures put us in a place where, if nothing else, we can say, help me to have the endurance to watch this. Help me to have the courage to not turn away. Help me to have the courage, the perception, to understand what you're doing, Lord. If we are willing to be a Greek, it is inevitable. It is inevitable that we will end up being a good Philip. If we are willing to be a Greek first and ask the question for ourselves and lay it on him, whatever it is. See, we want to do Jesus thinking for him. We assume that if we're angry, if we're confused, if there's something that's just not quite right, that we need to go somewhere else and get ourselves straightened up before we talk to God. If that's all you've got to offer to God, give it to him. An altar is an altar because of what happens on it. An altar is a place where a sacrifice is made. A sacrifice is the public, voluntary, irretrievable alienation of an asset. That means that if you are angry or scared or joyful, it's what you have to give to God, put it there. God will not grab it from your hands. God will wait for you to offer it. This is good Greek behavior. It really is. It is the behavior of those who are willing to say, I'm so sideways, I don't even know what I don't know. But my impulse, something driving inside me says, Jesus may have something about this that I need to know. What derives from that is a simple life that is very sophisticated and seemingly low-tech.
the kind of life that models who Jesus is in a way that is unmistakable. The kind of life that I wrote to you about on Friday. The 19th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church had the incredibly aristocratic Anglican name Henry St. George Tucker. And presiding bishop Tucker was the son of a bishop and a bishop himself. And following graduation from the Virginia Theological Seminary, he went into the mission field in Asia. By the time he was presiding bishop, he was bishop during the Second World War and toward the end of it, he was still presiding bishop. And the army of occupation sent chaplains into every village in Japan. Chaplains. I'm sure they were looking for all sorts of things, but among them, they were looking for a way to take the temperature of the Japanese people to understand better how to be the army of occupation that was something more than just brutally crushing and into a remote village, a cadre of chaplains go, and they say, have you heard of Jesus Christ? And they say, who is this? And the chaplains make various sort of descriptive remarks that he did this, he said that. And the elders stopped the chaplains and said, he's been here. And they thought something was being lost in translation. And So they tried again, and the elders stopped them again and said, no, he's been here. And he said, okay, tell us about that. What does that look like? What do you mean when you say to us, he's been here? And the elders in that village described a young missionary named Henry St. George Tucker, who had come among them in humility having sought Jesus himself and simply lived a life that looked enough like him that people who were not originally Christian, when asked later, said, oh, he's been here. That's where the Greek question is going It's going from serving up your own stuff and sitting with Jesus while he deals with it and you so that when the time comes, if someone is asked, they can say, oh, he's been here and mean you. But that you starts with the Greek question. Sir, we would see Jesus. I think that's the question for the Mass for the fifth Sunday in Lent. Sir, we would see Jesus. And I bid your prayers for yourself first and foremost throughout the remainder of this hour that you may see him And that the life that derives from that vision will more and more closely hew to what the world is dying to see. Sir, we would see Jesus. You're willing to stand in? Amen.